Sabbe satta bhavantu sukitatta bhavantu sukitatta Hello, I'm Dharmasar, and this is my lion's roar. You're probably wondering, what is this thing, the Dharmasar solution? Well, first of all, you need to understand who I am. I am an enlightened being. I didn't get that way by accident. I became enlightened after a lifelong quest for knowledge and realization, involving many different methods, many different teachers, many different philosophical ideas and practical exercises, a lifetime of work. And you might think, well, enlightenment sounds cool, but I couldn't do that. But let me tell you, I'm going to show you right here in this video how I did it and how you can do it too. I'm nobody special. I'm just an ordinary human being on planet Earth. And yet, I was able to realize something beyond, something infinite, something absolute. And anybody can do it, if I can do it, because the capacity for enlightenment is an essential trait of a human being. So now let's take a further look into this subject. If you study spiritual life, you have to come to the conclusion that no one path or method can give complete enlightenment. Yes, there are many paths, many methods, but all of them are limited. All of them are specialized. And this is no accident. The division of the whole of human knowledge happened a long time ago in India. And now it's been uh, divided into all these little specialized schools. So to get the complete picture of the potential of the human being, you have to study all of them, or at least the majority of the more important ones, to get the overview. And then you can put together the puzzle and get the big picture. That's what this is all about. Because of the fragmentation of knowledge, enlightenment can only be approached by a holistic ontological approach. It cannot be found within the limits of any one faith, method, or path. So we have to expand our view to the whole of human spiritual knowledge throughout history and then see which of those methods are applicable to us and how to put them together and make them work together. So I call this approach the Dharmasar solution. So let's go into this and take a look at how I developed it and what it means for you. First of all, there are so many different religions, so many different paths, so many different methods. They all claim to be the absolute truth. They all claim to offer the highest benefits. And they all claim that the others are wrong. But let me ask you something. If all those other paths are wrong, how have they stuck around for thousands of years? If they're not delivering any benefit, if they're not delivering any value, well, why are people going to keep passing them on to others? Why are people going to keep studying and practicing them? Why are people going to keep writing them down? Because they're giving some benefit. They're giving some value. They each have some intrinsic worth. None of them are useless. So somehow or other, we have to consider the sum total of all the spiritual paths. All these spiritual traditions were developed in Asia thousands of years ago, and they've come down to us by a process of tradition. But of course, <laughs> traditions aren't really very traditional. If we study them, we find that they've gone throughout many changes since their inception. So if the teachings that we have today are different from the original, then how do we find out the truth? 
Well, both of these big questions are only answerable by a methodology or an approach that is as big as they are, or even bigger. And this is ontology. Ontology is the crowning achievement of Western thought. It is the science of sciences. It is the meaning of meaning. So ontology gives us the ability to look into these different paths and determine how to put them together for the optimum benefit. The atomic unit of ontology is called the triple. That is the minimum amount of information necessary to create meaning or knowledge. And a triple, of course, has three parts, the subject, the object, and the relation between them. And this is what we call a thing. So as soon as we see a thing, there's a subject, which is usually I. There's the object, which is the thing itself. And then there's the relation between ourselves and the object, which can be quite complex. But without these three factors, we don't really have a perception. We don't really have an experience. And we certainly don't have knowledge. So ontology is the key to decoding all the mysteries of self-realization. Now, practically, how do we do this? Well, let's say we take the entire field of religion and spiritual life, and we create an abstraction layer where we analyze each one of them according to ontological principles. And then we compare them, and we actually analyze the relations between the relations. And we come uh, to a meta field, or a meta map of the entire field of religion, human potential, and self-realization. As it turns out, the best meta map that we have is the chakra system, because this maps directly to our experience. So if we take these different spiritual and religious paths and analyze them according to the chakra system, we get something practical that we can implement. Now, the simplest version of the chakra system was given by Georges Gergif in the 1910s, 1920s. And he gave three centers, the moving center, the emotional center, and the intellectual center. If we go back to the Vedic scriptures, then some of these are divided further. The genitals are the first chakra and they deal in pleasure. The Dantian is the second chakra, and it deals in energy. The solar plexus, the third chakra, deals in movement. The heart chakra with emotion. The voice with language. The intellect deals with information. And finally, the crown chakra deals with ecstasy. Each of these chakras can be viewed as an ontological triple. For example, the genitals deal in pleasure. And what do they do? They flow. So we can say the genitals flow pleasure. Similarly, the dantian deals with energy. How? By storing it. So we can say the dantian stores energy, like a battery. Similarly, the solar plexus deals with movement. And what does it do? It controls or directs the movement. So we can say the solar plexus directs movement. And the heart deals with emotion. And how does it deal? It feels the emotion. So we can say the heart feels emotion. Similarly, the voice deals with language. And what does it do? It transmits language. So we can say the voice transmits language. Then again, the intellect deals with information. How? By processing it. So we can say the intellect processes information. And finally, the crown chakra deals with ecstasy alone. And how does it do that? It realizes it. So we can say the crown chakra realizes ecstasy. Now, connected with each of these centers or chakras is a method 
or a spiritual path. The genitals flow pleasure and that is developed through Tantra. Then the Dantian stores energy and that is developed through Qigong. The solar plexus directs movement and we can cultivate that through yoga, Tai Chi, dance, and so many other methods. The heart feels emotion and we can develop and analyze that also through bhakti or the science of rasa, which is not well known in the West, but very important. The voice transmits language and the best realization of that besides writing and speaking is music and mantra. The intellect processes information, but how does it do that? Or what's the best way for it to do that? And of course the answer is right view, according to the Buddha, and dhyana or meditation, or jhana as it's called in Buddhism. And finally, the crown chakra realizes ecstasy, and that is the goal of all these paths. All these paths and methods, when applied properly, lead to experiences of profound ecstasy. And really this is what life is all about. But there's one particular kind of ecstasy that leads to enlightenment. And I'm not going to define enlightenment or nibbana here because that is the subject of a whole course, very extensive course, which is the final course in our series. And this is the first video, so it's a long way off yet. But that's where we're headed. We want to develop our capacity for ecstasy in every way possible, through every center of the body and their functions. How do we do that? We do it through something called dependent origination, which is the strategy of becoming. Most people begin from ignorance and then they fabricate a type of consciousness that is resting on name and form and that develops through the senses, their contacts, feelings, cravings, clingings, becomings, birth, aging and death, and results in suffering. Now when people reach this stage of suffering, when at the end of life everything is being taken away from them, the body is falling apart, the mind is falling apart, and they're going to have to leave this body and leave everything behind. Then, what most people do is go back to the beginning and start a whole new cycle of becoming based on ignorance. And of course, that's just going to have the same result. So we've been going around and around and around this cycle of becoming based on ignorance and really not getting very far. We're trying to end that. Well, how do we end it? Well, we do that by mastering the art of becoming. We learn the strategy of becoming and we find how we can utilize it to attain the type of life and being that we want. And then we begin the Eightfold Path. And the Eightfold Path is a specialized process of becoming that ends in Nibbana, enlightenment, unbinding, or freedom from the process of birth and death. And we're going to be going into that in great detail in this series. Now, I want to end with a warning. This is not to scare you off, but this is to protect you. I am an enlightened being, an arhant. I'm not a Buddha or anything like that, just an arhant. That's enough. I'm satisfied. And enlightened beings, or even beings just on the path to enlightenment, deserve a certain respect, a certain honorific, a certain caution, not to offend them, not to minimize them, not to criticize them. Yes, we're ordinary human beings. We have all kinds of faults and failures, weaknesses and limitations. But that doesn't mean that we're not worthy of respect. So it's very important to give an enlightened being, or even one who is on the path to that enlightenment, the proper respect. 
Otherwise, what can happen? Well, after I was on this path for a long time, actually it was about 10 years ago, I decided to go back and look up some of the people in my past who had treated me with disrespect and see what happened to them. I was just curious. But what I found was all of them are either missing, I can't find them anywhere, even on the internet, using people search tools, or they're dead, or they're sick or insane. This was shocking to me. I had no idea. I mean, my teachers and gurus were telling me, be very careful not to offend self-realized soul. But here I was seeing the actual result for myself. So now, a lot of people are going to say, I'm making an outrageous claim, it can't possibly be true, and they're going to dig up so many faults and uh, negative things about my past and so on like this, and you may hear this. Or you may come up with something yourself, find something about me that you don't like. And my warning to you is be very careful not to disrespect a self-realized being, a teacher, or even a student who's high on the path, because karma is real. So be careful. After all, I'm making an outrageous claim. It's not easy to become enlightened these days, and very few people do. And it took me a whole lifetime. Hard work, full-time effort, and some very good teachers, some very good information that I happen to come across in my search. So, the thing about enlightenment is that it's totally subjective. If you ask me to prove that I'm enlightened, well, there's no way that I can actually prove it. But one of the things about being enlightened is that you know you're enlightened. In fact, if you didn't know that you were enlightened, how could you claim to be enlightened? The thing is that other people looking from outside don't really see much difference, unless they're very sensitive and very aware themselves. So most people looking at me are going to see just an ordinary guy. Actually, there's only one way that you can know whether I'm telling the truth. And that is to learn these methods, apply them in your life, and see if they work. The courses are free. You can take them anytime you want. You can view the videos on YouTube anytime you want. And then you can see if this thing actually works. So, what are you waiting for? Go to our course site and get started. Sabbe Satta Bhavantu Sukitatta Bhavantu Sukitatta